All right, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to this lecture on um, uh, on reactors and power in uh, EMCH five fifty two. So um, the today we're going to be talking all about um, sort of reactors and how they generate power and uh, thus electricity. Um, so we're going to start with um, sort of, we're going to shift gears a little from how we were interacting with respect to the, uh, all of the reactions and all of the fundamental physics that we had uh, engaged in. But um, we're now talk about how all of that physics plays together uh, in order to generate electricity. So uh, the first subtopic today is chain reactions, right? So this is how you get a self-sustaining chain reaction that keeps these interactions that nuclides have with neutrons going. So uh, uh, basically the idea behind chain, chain reactions is that because some neutron uh, reactions uh, or some neutron absorption reactions reactions specifically uh, produce uh, produce more neutrons uh, and in particular fission <coughs> um, there is the possibility for more neutrons to be created than destroyed. Created, we'll say per time step, then uh, destroyed or existed before, or existed originally. Um, and specifically, the rate of neutron growth um, or neutron population growth is called the multiplication factor. Okay? So this is a pretty important term. Um, now the multiplication factor gets the symbol K, so we will say that k, lowercase k, is equal to um, the uh, number of neutrons in generation g plus 1 divided by the number of neutrons in generation G. Okay? So, whoops. Uh, wow, it did not like the, uh, the spaces. <laughs> uh, I think this will work. Yeah, there we go. The things I do for LaTeX, right? Um, so basically, this is a statement about um, so how the number of neutrons in proportion to the number that existed evolves uh, as a function of time, right? So uh, one way to think about this is sort of chains of reaction. So let's go ahead and draw a little diagram on the board here. So let's say that we have at, let's have a couple of time steps here. So t equals zero. So this will be our first generation. Uh, and then we'll have t equals one and uh, t equals two. Oops. Um, t equals 2, etc. And so 
Um, let's go ahead and partition this out a bit. Okay, so initially what we have in our example here is that we've got some nuclide and there's a neutron. Let's consider the case of fission. So a neutron comes in um, and then from the reaction at t equals zero, let's say we have two, uh, oops, two neutrons fly off, right? Um, and so, uh, and these two neutrons then on T1 interact with two other of our target particles. And each of these, when it interacts, when it's absorbed uh, and then destroyed, uh, each of these creates oops, it's not the right, two more neutrons, right? So now um, we've got f four of these. Um, for example, oops, and each of these four interacts with its own target nuclide, right? We're in a material, so there's no shortage of target atoms. And of course, you know, each of these produce two um, neutrons through this reaction, through a, an example absorption reaction. Um, and so what we see is um, so in this, in this, what we see is that the neutron population is actually growing, right? So at t equals zero, we can say that what well, we have one, or at t equals zero, we can say that we have two nuclides. This neutron comes from t equals minus one. Um, and so we have two, and then at time one, we have four, and then at time two, we have eight, um, and so on. And so, uh, uh, this is what we mean by a multiplication factor. So in this case, a multiplication factor is really high, right? It's it's two. For every neutron in the system, the next time step you get a you get two neutrons. Um, uh, so that's uh, pretty impressive. Let's go back to the web here. And so um, uh, as we discussed it in chapter three, the mean neutron generation time, right, with delayed neutrons is about uh, a tenth of a second. So 0 0.1 second uh, in a normal reactor. So that's a rule of thumb just to keep, uh, or a handy number to keep in your back po pocket. Um, and there's other ways to define, so luckily we don't have to go and count all the neutrons, there's other ways to define these things that keep the same meaning. So, uh, or that, that keep k, our multiplication factor, that have the same meaning. So, for example, it's imp uh, there's a couple of important cases for k, so we'll go through those right now. Um, so, the first case is that when k equals 1, um, uh, the system is what we call uh, critical. Oops. Yeah, k equals one. The system is critical, um, and this means that there are the same number of neutrons on every in every generation. Okay? And this corresponds to normal reactor operation. Right? It's a steady state point, right? You have the same number that you had uh, before. Um, now, when k is greater than 1, this, uh, we call this situation that the reactor or the system is um, supercritical. And that means that we are gaining neutrons, uh, or the neutron population grows. And this particular situation is needed for startup, right? So as we're going up to full power, we need to have more neutrons every generate 
every time every ne neutron generation time than we had before so that we can ramp up to higher power levels um, so um, oh, there's no space here I think. Um, Unsurprisingly, the third case is when k is less than 1. And in this case, the reactor is called subcritical. And uh, this is when, of course, then the neutron population decreases. Um, uh, and this is needed for shutdown. Right, so when we're going from a, a, power, a high power state uh, and we want to go to a lower power state or zero, right? We need the number of neutrons to decrease, so fewer fissions end up happening. Okay, so that's just some terminology uh, on sort of what chain reactions look like and what they are. Uh, so uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about uh, is uh, what's known as conversion. Okay, so conversion is the process by which non-fissile materials absorb neutrons and become fissile nuclides. Um, so as you might recall, uh, this is when uh, these species are fertile. So conversion is the process by which non-fissile uh, materials um, absorb uh, nuclides, right, adding to their atomic number, or at, at absorb neutrons, sorry, and become fissile, uh, uh, and become fissile. Help if I build it right. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, right, so the original uh, non-fissile nuclide uh, for which conversion is possible is called fertile, right? So it's something that uh, wasn't fuel, but then becomes fuel, can become fuel. And the most important example of this is the nuclide U-238, right? So the very common uranium-238. And so what happens with U-238 is that, um, so we'll see, so uh, U, um, oops, <laughs> U238 uh, plus a neutron will uh, decay by gamma emission to um, uh, Uh, U239, right? So it absorbs a neutron, like the neutron is absorbed, right? That's what we're talking about. It goes to U239 plus a gamma particle, which then goes to um, your uranium 239 decays by beta emission, uh, beta minus emission, so it gets rid of an electron. It's got too much charge. Uh, uh, or not, yeah, not enough charge in the nucleus, too many neutrons. So um, this goes to uh, 239, Neptunium 239 plus the beta minus, which then goes to uh, finally um, uh, Plutonium 239 plus. Uh, uh, beta particle, a uh, beta minus. Oops. And then what else? What else did I do wrong? Uh, 
There we go. So hopefully you all followed this, right? So a neutron is absorbed by U-238, it becomes U-239 almost immediately, and then U-239 very quickly um, decays uh, through Neptunium-239 into Plutonium-239, and Plutonium-239 is really, really fissile. It's, it's even, depending on what you're doing, it's basically as good as Uranium-238, if not better, in some situations. So, um, Another important example of this, which follows a very similar decay chain, um, is thorium, if you're interested in the thorium fuel cycle. So thorium-232 absorbs a neutron and releases a gamma, which then becomes thorium-233, uh, um, which de decays by um, beta minus emission to protactinium, uh, 233, um, which then decays to uh, uranium-233, which is also fertile. So these are a couple of conversion chains. So you're taking something that you have in abundance, nat which are the high natural abundance, like uranium-238 or uh, thorium-232, and you're converting it to something that has uh, a very is fissile and is going to, when that species fissions, when plutonium-239 fissions or uranium-233 fissions, they release a lot of neutrons and they, um, and a, a zero energy neutron can go in there and uh, cause the fission. Um, so the rate of conversion, at which a conversion occurs is called, uh, so from fresh fuel to used fuel, is called the conversion ratio. So basically it's the in what you put in fresh, uh, um, it's a ratio of, of how many uh, uh, fissionable materials you have in the output minus what you have in the input. So, um, oops. So we'll say that the conversion ratio, so this is how you measure how good reactors are at converting. And this is given the, the symbol CR. So CR is defined as oops, the number density of fissionable species um, use in used fuel. Uh, Um, so it's the number density of fissionable species in used fuel minus the number density of fissionable species in fresh fuel divided by the number of fissionable species that you started with. Right, so it's a relative fraction, right? So this number um, is going to say like, okay, I started with this much uranium-235 or fissile. Um, or I started with this much uh, uh, uranium or plutonium-239, and then when I took my fuel out of my reactor, I had this uh, different amount. And uh, I'm going to say that's greater or less than uh, how much. So, uh, or and that's that's what gives us scaling. Okay, um, a relative scaling for. Uh, for the for how much how good the reactor is at converting, um, so in the case where um, oops, CR is less than one, um, this is called burning. Reactors that do this are called burner burners because the um, the you're basically getting rid of fissile material, right? You're removing it from the system. You're just fissioning it off and releasing energy. And if it's greater than one, um, oops, 
this is called breeding because you're getting more fissile species out than you put in in the first place. So that's um, that's this really interesting ability of the nuclear fuel cycle is that you can actually end up, if you only count U-235 and plutonium-239 and other fissile species as the real fuel, the high octane fuel, nuclear can give you more fuel atoms out than you put into the reactor in the first place, which is pretty sweet. So. Uh, yeah, not to be over, overstated. Okay. So the next, one of the other key parameters of reactors is called burn-up. Um, so uh, burn-up is the measure. Oops, burn-up. Um, which we normally abbreviate with the letters BU. Um, is the burn-up, or burn-up is the uh, measure of the total energy gained uh, per unit mass, right? So it's a, it's a specific measure. It's a per unit mass measure. Um, and it's often given in units of megawatt days, right? So megawatts is a power. Uh, but burn up measures energy, so uh, power times a time is an energy, so megawatt days. Um, and since it's specific, this is pure per kilogram of fuel that you put in the reactor. Um, or uh, equivalently, it's sometimes read as gigawatt days per metric ton. Okay? Um, and so that's a. Uh, that's basically how it goes. So uh, that that's what it is. And um, about one gram of U-235, uh, well, of, I, I should say pure U-235, um, corresponds to, uh, uh, or this has about one megawatt day. Uh, of energy in it. So if you were to burn every atom, <laughs> um, uh, U-235 has a burn up of 1,000 uh, 1, megawatt days per kilogram. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, it packs a lot, a huge punch, right? Uh, um, now you're not gonna f be able to fission, in, in reality, you're not gonna be able to fission um, every single atom in a gram of U-235 because that would take an infinite number of neutrons, right? You know, you'll never get the, the last neutron. So um, this is the theoretical maximum. So, um, so I'll say that, and if you want to be more specific, the theoretical maximum, uh, which is based on uh, the rest mass of the particle and the 200 MeVs that you get released per fission, as we discussed la in the last chapter. Um, uh, the theoretical maximum is 950 or 951 really megawatt days per kilogram. So if you were able to fission every atom in a fissioning system, you'd get about 951 megawatt days per kilogram by converting all the mass to uh, energy of in that 200 MeV per fission. Um, but in practice, oops, let me. Uh, uh, for reactors, uh, for real reactors, burn-ups of used fuel are between 40 and 60 uh, megawatt days per kilogram. So we're really far from the total uh, theoretical maximum. And so if you want to think about this in terms of uh, sort of the energy 
content or the, the total energy, the total fission energy content um, uh, of used fuel. This means that when we take um, a fuel out of a reactor, you're, we're re we've really only used about 5%, right? 50 megawatt, it's 50 megawatt days per kilogram divided by 950 megawatt days per kilogram. It's only about 5% of the total fission energy. So it's a very American thing throwing away 95% of the energy, potential energy that's in that system. Uh, <laughs> um, but it, it actually happens that the, the practical limits, right, because you would need an infinite number of neutrons to fission every last atom, unless you were doing it in some targeted way. Um, the practical limits, even for very deep burn systems, are closer to 650 to 700 megawatt days per kilogram. But, you know, so we're, 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 all, we're that's more like a 10% number uh, uh, or 8% number. So, um, yeah, so that's the situation. Okay, so reactors. Um, uh, so now that we've got some of these basic concepts of sort of what the energy going in and, and coming out is, um, uh, so reactors follow the principle of using a heat source to boil water to turn a, to turn a turbine, um, like a lot of other power reactors. So. Of using a heat source, i.e., the fuel, the fissions, uh, uh, to boil water um, in order to turn a turbine uh, and generate electricity. Okay, um, so what does this look like uh, in the specific case of, uh, of nuclear engineering? Well, what you might have is, oops. <laughs> so, uh, well, maybe I should just go, I'm gonna go find, any, maybe I'll go find an example picture after this. But what you have over here is a core with some control rods uh, in uh, at some level. So you've got this core, and then off of the core, there's a primary loop, um, which contains, uh, in a pressurized water reactor, it'll contain pressurized water. Um, and so uh, in boiling water, it contains steam that then returns as water. So. This is the uh, primary loop. Um, uh, and then this connects to a uh, heat exchanger. Um, which then connects to a secondary loop. Um, so let's draw that secondary loop in here. I'll call this the heat exchanger um, so this block here is the heat exchanger um, uh, out of the heat exchanger this then connects oops uh, um, this then connects to a turbine job of drawing here. Uh, uh, and then let's go ahead and connect this back. Oops. I don't know why my undo keeps uh, connecting to that. So this is our secondary loop. And then uh, at the end of this, there's a condenser, uh, or attached to the secondary loop is a condenser, which then uh, corresponds to a third loop, uh, connects it to a connects the secondary loop to a third loop, which is 
um, an environmental heat sink, uh, such as a cooling tower or, simple, or similar. So, and then and then sir, and then. Uh, oh. Heat sink, e.g., for example, a uh, cooling tower. Okay. Uh, so this is the, uh, or sometimes a river or a lake or the ocean or one of those. So. And basically, various different reactors have a, have different variations on this design, but effectively what you're using is you're using fuel in this core to heat up water and then eventually turn this turbine. Um, and let's see if we can't find, come on, there we go. And then uh, I'll go to Google and then Images. Yeah, so as an example, oop, <laughs> this isn't the image I wanted. Yeah, so this is a pretty classic image here. Um, uh, so you can see, again, right, you've got your core um, connects, it has this primary loop. Um, uh, which then goes to a uh, generator or, or turbine, um, and then before that loop gets condensed, returning back to the turbine, and then the, the other end of the condenser um, connects to the um, uh, connects to the environment, so and releases heat and waste there, or uh, it releases the excess heat uh, from that sec from the secondary loop back out to the environment. Uh, so that's sort of what reactors look like schematically. Um, okay, so uh, moving right along, I know this is a, a wild uh, uh, introduction to sort of all the various different pieces, but uh, next up we have what's called the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, there's a whole course on this, so we're just going to kind of talk about the highlights, um, and we'll say that the nuclear fuel cycle is the process by which material is extracted from the environment, so mined, typically uranium is mined, um, turned into a fuel, uh, right? So converted into fuel rods, um, then burned through nuclear burning in a reactor, right, by fission. Uh, sometimes it's potentially, the fuel is potentially recycled because you, because of conversion, you can end up with more fuel atoms. So you want to, some, sometimes people want to recover those. So we'll say potentially recycled and then finally disposed of. And then waste or used fuel is finally disposed of. Okay, so there's a couple of different major types of fuel cycles um, uh, that that exist and uh, we'll go ahead, I'll go ahead and draw those schematically right now. So um, the first one, and the one that we use in the United States, is called the once through fuel cycle. And so this is an, an open fuel cycle where um, the fuel only goes through the reactor once. Um, so, oops, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna, oops. <laughs> So in the once through fuel cycle, oops, what is going on? 
that. Um, we start with a mine, a uranium mine typically, sometimes a thorium mine. Um, this mine ends up going to, um, uh, oops, uh, is then goes to a milling operation. So this is where uranium ore is converted into what's called yellow cake or U308. Um, okay. From the mine, oh, I don't know why I wrote mine there twice. This is supposed to be mill. Uh, uh, milling and conversion uh, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, UF6 gas. here and then after uh, after conversion right you still have natural uranium and so you want which is 0 0.711 uh, percent U-235 and what we want is 5 percent U-235 so this then uh, goes to an, through an enrichment process typically um, uh, and this is what people get upset at other countries for trying to do because you also need enrichment for weapons. Um, but rather than going to 5% U-235, weapons grade stuff goes to 95 or, uh, or 80, at least 80% U-235. Um, uh, after enrichment, we then have to make a fuel out of it. So it goes to a fuel fabrication facility um, to create what we think of as rods, fuel rods, etc. And then after that, finally, we are in a situation where the fuel, the fresh fuel can be loaded into the reactor. And so um, that's what happens. And then in the once through fuel cycle, the next step after the reactor is um, disposal. And so you may have heard of Yucca Mountain uh, or, or the waste isolation pilot plant or uh, other things other folks have done, but in the once through fuel cycle, it doesn't matter how you get rid of it. The point is that you just go ahead and uh, you put it through the reactor. You put this fuel through the reactor once and you try to get rid of it. Um, OK, so that's the once through. Um, so the next idea that I'm going to uh, show you is that there's a notion of um, uh, or is a recycle scenario. So let's see if I can get this to actually paste, which I can't. That's annoying. Okay, so, uh, okay, then I'll just edit this. So in the recycle scenario, um, rat, the whole front end, what's called the front end, the beginning part of the fuel cycle here is all the same, and, and the fuel goes to the reactor. Um, but rather than going to a um, disposal facility immediately, what happens is uh, the fuel ends up going to what's called a reprocessing facility or a recycling. It's a recycling. Reprocessing or separations is sometimes what it's called. And reprocessing is where basically the the fissile material or the and of the, or the transuranics and so uranium and plutonium and um, and thorium and all that and and curium and americium are all extracted uh, so that they can create a, f a fresh fuel, a new fresh fuel, and the other stuff, all of the um, all of the fission products that just sit there and absorb neutrons, those are all disposed of. And so what we have coming off of reprocessing is we send the good stuff to another fuel fabrication facility, a different one, um, because the fuel is different um, in many ways, chemically and electronically, or chemically, not chemi chemically and neutronically, sorry. Um, uh, and then from the new fr fuel fab, uh, in a recycle scenario, it goes back to a reactor, right? So we end up with this cycle on our, 
on our flow sheet here. And then the stuff that we don't like, um, there's always there's always some waste, and so that waste always has to go to disposal. Um, now this kind of system, a recycle system, can extract a lot more energy uh, out of the initial fuel that was mined, right? So more burnup happens per initial atom mined because it goes that stuff always goes back into the reactor. Okay. And with that, I think we'll call it a day. And uh, oh, it looks like I'm sort of off the side here. But uh, I hope this was. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy your day. Um, yeah, like I said, on the fuel cycle, there's a whole class on it, so we're not going to get involved in uh, too deeply in any of this. We're just going to focus on the reactors for the next, uh, well, for the rest of the class. So, all right, thanks a lot. Bye. -bye.